Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Martin Andrews from Inquire Ed, and it's so great to have you here joining us for Inquiry versus Knowledge Building, Dismantling the False Dichotomy. This is the first webinar in our new series, The Science of Building Knowledge, and we're so excited to have you, and we want to tell you all about the webinars coming up, but we'll save that till the end. Well, I would love to welcome right now our uh, panelists today. We're joined by Shanti Ellen Govan and Elizabeth Ventling Simon. And so Shanti and Elizabeth, I'm gonna stop my share and ask you to come on and say, welcome to our first webinar. It's great to have you both here today. Thanks, Martin. Appreciate it. It's good to be here. I see a lot of familiar names in the chat in the uh, participant list. So it's exciting to yeah, see. Yeah, it's great to see those people that um, our webinar regulars come back. And um, also, I think there's a lot of new people on there. And I, actually, we have a lot of different, um, not just a social studies group, maybe we have some ELA folks. Um, so before we get started, uh, and you tell us, uh, you dismantle this false dichotomy for us. <laughs> We were a little sensationalist, I was by the yeah, way. Yeah, that's a that's a great title. Like, wow. Let me tell you. Um, <laughs> a little sensational here. <laughs> so uh inquiry and knowledge building. We've been hearing a lot about knowledge building in um both social studies and the ELA world. Before we jump in, like give me two sentences, Shanti, that that why does knowledge matter in social studies, but also in elementary and high school and middle school instruction in general? Yeah, I, I'm not going to say it in two sentences. I guess I'll say, I guess I'll say, I'll say this. My first sentence would be, it's false to say that I just need information at my fingertips, that that's all that's needed. And two, I would say that knowledge is an equalizer. It is a, it is our, a path to equity. Um, and so it's truly needed and maybe even more more needed in a world when all the information is here. Um, so that was more than two That seconds. was close to two, two, two seconds. Elizabeth, can you do it in two? I can't say anything in two, two minutes. <laughs> Yeah. But I would I would repeat everything that you said. You know, our ability to think critically and solve problems is is so dependent upon like what we know and understand um, and our ability to do that. Is, is limited by um, having to access that information at a surface level on Google. Great, so I'm actually gonna turn this over to you and I'm gonna head over to the chat and uh, I will come back at the end uh, with questions and we can do a little Q&A session. That sounds great. And Martin, um, you know, despite our sensationalist title here, let's, we'd love to treat this as a conversation. So please jump in Martin, if you see that Elizabeth and I are missing something in the chat. Welcome all. Uh, we're excited to be here. And, you know, Elizabeth and I, is for being a co-founders, we rarely get to present together. So on our webinar. So yeah, almost is, never. I, yeah, I don't even know, remember the last time we get to do a webinar together. So this is fun um, for us, uh, selfishly. So we're going to be talking today a bit about kind of this dichotomy that we're seeing in terms of this idea that inquiry and knowledge building are on these kind of far ends of a spectrum. We often hear this dichotomy in spaces that we're in, that on one end of the spectrum, we have folks thinking about teacher delivered and really associating that with high knowledge based curriculum or instruction. And on the other side of it, we see this idea that there's student centered instruction and low knowledge um, being built in those uh, in that instructional practice. You know, at their worst, what we kind of see is the memes about this is that you, this idea of teacher delivered. So if the student centered world was going at teacher delivered, they'll kind of talk about this as, you know, consume, hold, regurgitate, repeat this idea of just, you know, reciting facts. And then when the teacher delivered, maybe, you know, high knowledge folks are talking sometimes about a uh, student centered, low student centered practice, they'll say things like this child, mom, will you teach me how to make a cake? Sure, here are the ingredients. Use your curiosity to figure out how they work together. Sounds ridiculous, right? Yet this is what happens when schools use inquiry-based instruction over learning over direct instruction. And what is true for us and what we believe really, really strongly, both Elizabeth and I and the rest of Inquire Ed, is that this is a complete false dichotomy. And what we, we you know, I've jo been joking about the sensational title, but I think it's challenging to say like, oh, you can have both because that's not actually what we're trying to say. 
what we're trying to say is actually we can't pit these things against each other and think that like it is this or it is this or we'll like sometimes do this and we're sometimes do that and that will be what it is. What we want to do is say that this is not, we can't think of it as dichotomous way. And that when we're talking about high quality instructional materials in social studies, they really need to be both. They need to be student centered and they need to be high knowledge building. It's not a, oh, it could be this or it could be that. It actually has to be both. And as instructional material designers, we have a responsibility to ensure that both of those things are happening at the same time. And so this presentation today isn't going to be about kind of talking a lot about the inquiry side of it. Um, we, the truth is, is that we have a lot of folks on this call that probably know that we talk all the time about what we might talk about in inquiry-based practice. We are going, we are not talking about that separate from inquiry. We would say that knowledge is a part of really strong inquiry-based instruction. That again, what we think about those high quality instruction materials, but we're going to focus in and really talking about knowledge in this presentation, because it isn't what is being talked about as much in the social studies space. And we really think it's important that it's really being brought to the forefront in social studies. So I want to start by just talking about like, why does knowledge matter in social studies? Like, what does it have to do with social studies? Hopefully this is obvious, but it might not be. Uh, why is that not turning? Here we go. Knowledge matters because knowledge promotes equity. I said this at the beginning, it's an equalizer that we can't expect, you know, the number of times I hear sometimes people will say is like, well, that the students didn't know that. So I, I wasn't sure if I could teach that. The, we, that's our job as educators. We've got to really build that knowledge in the classroom so that students are coming out with that. And we can't expect that they've gotten it from somewhere else. Knowledge enables disciplinary thinking and skills. Elizabeth just said this, is that oftentimes people will talk about critical thinking skills or problem solving skills you can't critically think without knowledge. Like you need knowledge. If you think about any of the things that you do in your jobs every day, you have you need knowledge to be able to create, you need to be deep knowledge to be able to critically think about that. And so those are the kinds of things that we need to be able to get to those disciplinary thinking and skills that go beyond just critical thinking to lots of different things. Knowledge creates space for problems. Oh, I forgot that we did this separately. Elizabeth, I apologize. I'm so sorry. Let's just say I said the same thing there. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, all right. What does the research tell us about how students build knowledge? Um, we've kind of tried to codify based on a lot of the reading that we have done in the knowledge space to really kind of five things. Um, and Elizabeth's going to take us much deeper on each of these, but I'll just kind of hit them at a high level. So first thing is just knowledge builds on knowledge. Uh, second one is this idea that, so just like hitting on that, it's just this idea that higher knowledge is necessary for new acquisition of knowledge, that we can't just think that like you can come into this super complex idea and just get there right then, that knowledge needs knowledge to stick to. Um, engagement and attention, that students need to be engaged, that that knowledge isn't going to go anywhere if those students aren't engaged. Uh, explicit instruction. So I'm going to say it, you know, sometimes people will say like, you're talking about explicit instruction, I thought you were the inquiry people. Again, I'm going to say, I believe that explicit instruction is a deep, important part of inquiry-based practice, and that explicit instruction supports students as they build that new knowledge and is needed to build that new knowledge. Um, authentic application, that that knowledge isn't going to do anything. It's not going to be sticky unless we ensure that students are authentically applicating it so they can get them to those higher order thinking skills. Um, and then schema building. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what this means in terms of really allowing students to transfer their learning into new and novel contexts. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth from here to take us a little bit more in depth into each of these concepts. Uh, Elizabeth, jump right in. Thank you. And I'm going to go off so camera. Much. Sorry, I missed that. I'm going to go off camera. Jump in. Oh, great. Um, so yeah, knowledge builds on knowledge. Um, Go ahead, Shanti. Thank you. Um, so as Shanti said, prior knowledge is kind of, I, I think of it like a spider web. Um, the more we have, the stickier those strands. And when we're encountering something new, we're going to stick it to what we already know. And if we don't have any sticky strands, that piece of new information, it might fly right over our head or, or right through our spider web. Think of um, a movie you might have seen as a child and you didn't get any of the references or jokes when you were little, but then you saw it as an adult and it all had new meaning. This happens in the classroom too. 
So um, go ahead, thank you. So when we're encountering new content at school, kids who have a lot of background knowledge are making meaning of new information. They're sticking it on their web, they're adding strands, and students who don't have background knowledge are getting further behind because they didn't have the prior knowledge that they needed to understand the new information. So that knowledge can't build on knowledge. It doesn't have a foundation to stand on. So let's look at this in the context of a piece of curriculum. So um, this is from one of our units. And the big inquiry question is, how can we contribute to a healthy democracy? And there are many objectives in this unit. This is just one of them. Draw conclusions about how people impact democracy by applying their rights and responsibilities as citizens. And this is a, an objective that comes toward the end of this particular unit. I'd love to invite the participants in the chat what might students need to already know in order to meet this particular objective? What are some of the embedded concepts or um, understandings that they might need to have? Just throw them in the chat. What's democracy? What are the rights of citizens? What does draw conclusions even mean? What makes someone a citizen? Yeah, absolutely. Here are a few that I pulled from um, some of our lessons. Rights and responsibilities of citizenship, what rights we have, why they do and don't have some protections, the relationships between our, my rights and my personal responsibility, and what are the opportunities that um, for civic engagement that even exists um, at the community, state, tribal, national, or even global levels? What kind of knowledge and skills do you need to demonstrate or utilize in order to engage as a, as a citizen in the first place? We can see here that a really complex concept, like the one in this objective, has underlying concepts or underlying um, understandings that students need to have, and those are also really complex. So let's just take one of these objectives or one of these pieces of information here that are on the right. Opportunities for civic engagement, for instance. And we're gonna frame that as an underlying lower level objective, something that students need to grasp before they can tackle this more complex objective. And again, would love for you to drop some ideas in the chat. If we've turned this into an objective to describe our opportunities for civic engagement um, at all of these different levels, what do we need to know in order to meet this particular objective? Again, what might the underlying embedded concepts be that are living within this level? Yeah, what is civic engagement? How do I even find information about meetings or times? What does healthy mean? What are the structures at different levels? Yeah, levels of government, elected roles, the processes of making laws, electing people. And as a young person, you know, what are some examples of civic engagement that young people can take part in and others without voting rights? Thank you. So imagine, um, we'll, we'll come back to this, but imagine students grappling with all of these concepts, you know, on their own, um, through independent research, um, or just with, without guidance. Um, we understand that without a, a strong foundation, that more complex information, it's got nothing to stick to. Um, I, I need that context, or I need those foundational understandings in order to engage with those more complex understandings. Sorry, thanks, Shanti. So engagement and attention. Before I can grasp new information, it has to enter my brain in the first place. If it doesn't matter to me, it's impossible to keep my attention on it. So in our world that is just completely full of distractions, 
capturing the learner's attention is really critical. And I want to put a really fine point on this, that this is not about the teacher's personality or their classroom management. Compliance is not the same as engagement. So teachers can have a lot of great energy. They can have great classroom management. They can make students put their phones down, but that doesn't mean that their minds are actively engaged in the content. So this is it's really a role that curriculum has to play as well to not put the burden on the teacher to make content engaging. The curriculum also needs to make content engaging. And I say, you know, this is why inquiry can be so powerful when we're framing content around compelling questions, meaningful action, that's engaging. So here's another example from um, the same civics unit and some elements that we are thinking about as curriculum designers when we're embedding some architecture into the curriculum itself. So in this example, students are encountering a scenario about an internet ban, a possible internet ban. And next, they have the opportunity to react to that scenario, both with their opinion, would they like that, as well as their guesses about the law. Could this happen? What would it take for it to happen? Um, you know, what would I need to know even in order to answer that question? And then this scenario connects to their broader questions that we were kind of noodling on earlier. How can we contribute to a healthy democracy? And the underlying essential question, who's holding the power in our government and why? So as we're, those are just, you know, a few examples. That's not the only way that we engage students. Um, it's one example of how the curriculum architecture is designed to engage students both emotionally and cognitively. So we're framing around compelling and authentic questions, questions that don't have a single right answer. We're introducing that concept or phenomena to make meaning of the questions. We're establishing context and relevance, and we're activating prior knowledge and also some curiosity and some, some skin in the game when we're, when we're you know, giving students a provocation, something that would interest them or tap into their emotions in some way. Thank you. So engagement is so important, but engagement isn't enough. Students won't effectively build equitable knowledge on their own. Um, as Shanti said, I've heard it too. Um, I've heard people say that factual knowledge, it just doesn't really matter in the age of Google. Um, we have facts at our fingertips, and it's it's really what we do with information, um, the critical thinking that really matters. And I've, I've felt this way myself at times, but it, it really doesn't play out in reality. Research shows that when it comes to critical thinking and problem solving, it's actually less helpful to have access to a lot of external information than it is to have just some relevant information that we really know and understand in our long-term memories. That's because working memory can only process so much limited information at a time. So the cognitive overload can prevent us from effective problem solving. Think of... Um, Think of how you might strategically play a game that you're really good at versus how you might play a game when you're first learning the rules. Your ability to think strategically or uh, predict your opponent's next move is impacted by the amount of information that you're processing at once. So if you're just learning the game, you don't have those instincts. You don't have that muscle memory yet that allows you to just act um, in a moment without thinking about it. So explicit instruction manages the cognitive load. It does not mean that the teacher is delivering facts in a lecture while students are just sitting passively and absorbing. It means modeling, guided practice, scaffolding toward increasing independence and greater rigor. So let's revisit um, our objective from earlier. Go ahead, Shanti, thank you. That objective to draw conclusions about how people can impact democracy. And we talked about some of those like underlying um, pieces of knowledge, pieces of information that we have to understand in order to build up to answering this particular question. And as each one of these, you know, un unfurls here, 
you can kind of imagine it almost, I, th I think of it like a staircase. Each piece is uh, a stepping stone and the next piece of information layers on top of that. And you can see how you know each new understanding is building toward the next understanding. Explicit instruction is managing the cognitive load here by chunking new information, sequencing it really intentionally in a way that makes a lot of sense, and scaffolding toward that increasing conceptual and cognitive complexity. So you can see those, those lines at the top have more complex concepts, more complex relationships that are embedded within them than the ones we see at the bottom. And our instruction is really scaffolding toward that. Again, imagine. Imagine if students were encountering all of this at once or encountering it on their own through independent research, or if they skipped everything at the bottom and jumped right to the most complexity. Some inquiry-based instruction has been like this. So it's not surprising that people worry when they hear the word inquiry that it might not be effective or that it might not be equitable. I would argue that effective inquiry is structured with content that's chunked and sequenced so that students really deeply understand the information that they use to draw conclusions and to solve problems, to apply that disciplinary thinking that Shanti was talking about earlier. But that's also not enough. Knowledge on its own isn't enough. If we look at um, Bloom's taxonomy or Webb's depth of knowledge or, or any um, thinking matrix like that, we see that remembering facts is at the very bottom of any of those um, any of those taxonomies. Surface learning isn't sticky learning. So, for instance, we can memorize our times tables, but that doesn't mean that we can do multiplication. We can memorize our state capitals, but it doesn't mean we can interpret a map or find a location. It's the rigorous application of knowledge that fosters deeper learning. And that deeper learning is essential for understanding complex ideas, for building skill, for, again, solving problems and engaging in that disciplinary thinking. Think again of that game, that game that you're really good at, sports, board games, whatever. You can memorize the rules, but that won't make you good at the game. Someone might have given you some explicit instruction or some one-on-one -on -one coaching, but you also had to practice on your own to really internalize how the game worked and to develop those good instincts. They're not, they're not instincts at all. That's your deep knowledge that you don't have to think about anymore. You don't have to process in order to access. It's, it's deep in your long-term memory. And it's that application over and over again that builds that muscle memory, that builds that it puts it in your in your long term so that you can access it easily. So let's take another look at our, our civics unit and see an example of how higher order thinking, application, analysis, evaluation can reinforce, consolidate, and deepen knowledge. So this is a little um, earlier in the unit than what we looked at earlier. And at this point, students have learned about the branches of government, checks and balances, the powers at different levels, local, state, federal, but remembering the definition or remembering the, the simple surface level, um, what the Supreme Court does, that's very different than understanding how it impacts us or the relationship between the judicial branch and my rights under the Constitution. So here, students analyze some kid-friendly Supreme Court cases. They hear this scenario, and they're making a prediction based on what they already know. What do I think the ruling might be, or what do I think the judges are going to grapple with? And then they examine the case to understand the ruling. They also have the opportunity to compare their case with another group, because identifying the similarities across the cases help them understand the why that's underneath the rulings, how we're interpreting the, the Constitution and how that plays out in, in people's rights. So this application of learning helps deepen students' understanding of their rights and what the Constitution does and doesn't protect. Um, it's just one of many opportunities students have or should have to apply learning and to make those interpretations, to draw authentic conclusions in a structured inquiry. 
This relates to deepening their knowledge. It relates to um, applying that knowledge and disciplinary skill, and it builds toward those more complex actions. How are they going to contribute to a healthy democracy? What are their rights? How are those rights interpreted? Where are their limitations? Just one piece of that bigger puzzle. Thank you. So this all connects to schema. We, we know that granular facts, they don't transfer um, unless I'm learning about the exact same topic in the same way. But that deeper conceptual understanding and disciplinary skills, those do transfer. Those take that deeper learning. What am I applying um, in a new context? I think this is important in any subject area. But in social studies in particular, we're encountering new events in real time all the time. So specific facts about a war that happened 100 years ago might not really help me to literally comprehend this article I'm reading today, but my broader understanding of global conflict, war, foreign policy, my ability to evaluate cause and effect, relationships, all of those things are going to help me understand what I'm reading about in the world today and to understand, you know, for my own opinions about it. Um, it might have impact um, how I'm critically consuming information. It might impact how, how I vote. And so those, those broader schema that I can transfer to the next new thing um, that's really what we want to contribute toward. So we can see here how the that civics unit has this underlying architecture as well. So each topic is laying a foundation for the next topic by contributing toward that larger schema for U.S. government and, and for the role that people play within it and how it impacts them. So this is an it's an oversimplification, structure and function of government, rights and responsibilities of citizenship, opportunities to participate, all the underlying things within there um, are, are topics within themselves connected to, to, to facts that are underlying. But we can see how topics are sequenced within a structured inquiry that contribute to that larger schema and support that broader action that students will take. And of course, Knowledge is building over time from unit to unit and from year to year, um, you know, K-12 and beyond, of course, as well. So I'm going to pause there and hand it back to you, Shanti. Thank you, Elizabeth. Appreciate it. Um, and I'm probably messed up all of your animations here. I apologize. That's okay. <laughs> oh, it's always hard to drive for someone else. Uh, so, um, Thank you for that. Uh, I just kind of want to end us on this question of like, what does this mean for high quality instructional materials and social studies? Um, so much of the conversation over the last several years has been about inquiry based practice in social studies. And I think what's often gotten lot, what, what has, that has brought to the forefront is really important pieces of the conversation and application of authentic application of knowledge. Uh, students' voice and uh, their lived experience being within that inquiry, uh, really getting to those conceptual understandings. But I think what's sometimes gotten lost and what we sometimes see instructional materials fall short on is this really scaffolding of knowledge to ensure that we can get to that authentic application of knowledge so that we can get students into that schema building and ensure that they can apply it in a novel context. And so it's that slow scaffold of knowledge that really is a building block that is really necessary for inquiry and structured inquiry in our um, model. And so I think I'll, I'll end us there and just open it up. Martin, you want to come back um, for uh, questions? Sure. Yeah. Um, so one of the, one, some of the questions in the Q&A and in the chat um, and everyone in the chat, go ahead and um, uh, share some questions that you have. But one of the overwhelming feelings too is that what you're it seems like my response as a teacher would be oh it's so complex what you're trying to do so I need to pre-teach everything before I get to any really engaging questions mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. I think that would be that's a response that I'm I'm feeling um so I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that 
Elizabeth, if you want to take that one. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I would I would definitely disagree. Um, I don't think that we should look at these components of building knowledge as linear and sequential. So yes, I'm going to need to engage students before I can begin to build any knowledge. If they're not tuned in to what I'm doing, nothing is going to stick. But that doesn't mean that I can't immediately engage, engage in higher order thinking. I might make a prediction. I might make an inference. I might um, engage with a source in some way. Um, absent the context, I need to understand it deeply. And then I need to learn. I need to build that knowledge. I need to build that conceptual understanding. I need to revisit that complex source. My knowledge doesn't, um, I don't need to build it in ways that prevent me from doing any higher order thinking, from making those predictions, from um, grappling with my new learning in, in light of what I learned yesterday or what the prediction was that I thought I was making. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to misrepresent the scaffolding of understanding as being equivalent to only direct instruction until the very end when now I'm ready to do something by myself. Yeah. I'll also add, I think we miss sometimes how much kids enjoy learning facts, actually. Now, it's not enjoyable to learn them in a textbook that is just like, boom, 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 there's no time to process. That is not what we are talking about. And Elizabeth's talking about in that explicit instruction model. That's just flying through your some pages. I think that, it, that you know, my son, my 11-year-old son, we were talking about social studies and actually his uh, he's in middle school. He, he used to be in elementary school that used our curriculum, but he's in middle school and his social studies teacher is, I think, really great. And he loved his social studies teacher. And I was like, oh, what are, you, what, are you, uh, what are you excited about? And he's like, I just love the stories of social studies. Um, and just, and that's about the facts, right? That's like, what happened? What happened here? Those things. And so those aren't disengaging. They are things that can be very engaging and get us to those bigger conceptual understandings. And we need that knowledge to get there. Um, and I think kids appreciate the opportunity to have that rather than trying to be in this big discussion where they, we've all had those moments where people are trying to have this huge just conversation and you're just like, wait, what are we even talking about? I don't even know the vocabulary you're using, let alone able to really contribute to this conversation. That doesn't feel good. That doesn't feel engaging. That doesn't feel enjoyous um, if I don't understand those pieces of it. Is that some, I'm wondering about the role of the teacher in this as well. I think many teachers in inquiry, maybe in the, the push to inquiry in social studies, felt like, oh, they're, they're, my place is always on the side. Um, and it is never in a direct instructional model where like maybe telling a story that really connects to, um, that connects these facts and engages the students might be a way that I did that in the past, but that's not inquiry, you know, if I tell a story. So maybe just talk a little bit about uh, the the dilemma I think that the teacher is in when it's an either or dichotomy. Yeah, I, I really think what you're getting is like kind of this statement that people say of sage on the stage versus guide on the side kind of idea that teachers might be. Always hear that like, oh, you you never yeah. want to be the sage on the stage. You, you always want to be the guide on the side. Yeah, Elizabeth, you want to take that? Well. I think of the sage on the stage, guide on the side, I think of those as personas. Am I thinking of myself as the purveyor of wisdom to my students? Or am I sort of observing on the sidelines while they're they're the ones doing the work? And I it, it feels like that's also a little bit of a false dichotomy when we're comparing it with this model. You can facilitate learning in ways that students are engaging in the work and working independently. Um, you can also lead students to do very challenging, rigorous work that you are facilitating directly. Um, I think I would, it might be helpful to just think about how we're defining inquiry. If we're defining inquiry as the pursuit of an investigation, we are learning information. Um, some of that is factual. Some of that is conceptual. Um, we're building skill that 
allow us to pursue an investigation, to respond to a question, to draw our own conclusions, and to take some kind of action. That's how I'm defining inquiry. That's not how all people are defining inquiry. That is very different from leaving learning to chance by having students uh, discovering information on their own that is not equitable. They, they, they are not going to achieve equal learning. Um, that's not to say that students can't engage in independent learning or that students discovering things are not important. Of course they are. Um, but I would not say that the, the guide on the side um, or the sage on the stage are the right um, the right personas for what we're talking about, but I can definitely understand that cognitive dissonance. I definitely had the like sage on the stage is a bad thing. I never want to be that. Um, but also as the facilitator of the learning, um, I'm not exactly on the side either all the time. Um, a couple questions from Scott and Joanna, and I really appreciate Scott's question. And he's asking, like, I think, if the role of what also could be the role of the teacher in direct instruction could be in the in a metacognitive way where the teachers are making their thinking visible to their students, like making their thinking processes visible to their students. Could either of you talk a little bit about that as a way to um, in the sort of inquiry direct instruction um, dichotomy? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, teacher modeling, think alouds, those are really valuable. I wouldn't say that's the only explicit instruction that teachers are engaging in. They might be facilitating um, some, some guided practice, or there might be um, some scaffolded gradual release of a particular skill where the teacher is still guiding students through that. So yes, modeling, think alouds, things like that are definitely part of, of what, what might be encompassed in, in that larger suite of instructional moves. Yeah. Um, Joanna asked, do you have particular recommendations for finding out about students' prior knowledge so that you can connect with it and not overload them? And I'm going to ask both of you this to respond to that question. But I also want to say um, we have over a hundred amazing educators on this webinar right now. So if someone else in the chat sees and connects to uh, the question that Joanne, Joanna is asking, please also respond because we want to hear from you and from your wealth of experience as well. So particular recommendations for finding about, out about prior knowledge so you can connect with it and not overload them. Yeah. Um, one one way that I like to structure that within the curriculum that we're providing, of course, teachers have to know their students and in every student population is different. Um, but we begin with with questions. So posing students, um, you know, a provocation or a phenomena, we use the QFT protocol. What questions do you have about this? What do you need to know in order to answer this bigger question? What do you need to know first? Um, what are you curious about or what do you need to understand in order to take that action? And students' own acknowledgement of what they don't already know, what they need to learn um, and where their curiosities are, that tells us a lot, I think, about what's, what students' readiness is. Um, same, same with adults. You know, if we're, we're thinking about um, what we need to know and how sometimes we don't even know what we don't know as the more we learn, the more questions we have. Um, and we see that as well. So as students revisit their questions, as they gain new learning, they're thinking about what have I answered? What else, you know, what else do I have a, a wondering about now? I didn't even know that was a thing, but now I have a hundred questions about it that I need to, that I need to dig deeper on. So lots of more, um, lots of more formal and concrete pre-assessments as well, but that's that's, that's one that I think is really valuable um, in an inquiry-based classroom. Well, I'll kind of tie a couple of questions here, just building off what Elizabeth said there. There's a question about high-quality instructional material guidelines. There's a question about teacher background knowledge around particular topics. And, um, you know, Scott was talking about formative assessments. A lot of these things are also really challenging. Sometimes teachers will use a KWL chart, uh, know, uh, want to know, learn, 
And I remember being in my classroom and sometimes the student would say they know something and I'd be like, well, that's actually not true. What do I do about that right now kind of thing? And something that I really love that uh, Elizabeth and, and the uh, curriculum team at Inquire have done a really amazing job of thinking about how do we frame questions within the learning outcomes? Um, how do we really think about authentic questions that don't send, set students up for false ideas of what they know? Um, and that really goes to knowledge as well, is like, I, I think sometimes we kind of get to this idea of like, we'll just ask students and then we'll just run with that. But how does that actually align to the instruction and the scaffolding of the instruction? That's really complex. I, I just like really want to say, I when I was a classroom teacher, I was not aware of how complex that was to really do that work and really think deeply about that. I think I was a pretty good curriculum designer for my classroom, but I, I don't think I thought as deeply about how am I connecting all of these pieces so that I'm ensuring that all of my students are getting to the same learning outcome? How am I ensuring that I have the background knowledge to be able to do that and build those experiences so they do scaffold in that way and then still connect back to their questions and I create experiences that make sure that that provocation leads to the questions that are within those learning outcomes? I mean, it's just never ending. Um, and I'll just lead it back to Georgia's question is why I believe that we really need to think about what high quality instructional materials need to look like in social studies, because this is not something, it, it's really challenging to ask teachers to do all of that in the classroom on their own. Um, they need really rigorous, thoughtful, uh, comprehensive instructional materials that really can help support them in, in doing all of those complex things that we were talking about. And it's challenging too, because I think uh, another part of Jordan's question is like local civics oriented current events. And it's hard to, you know, it, it's hard to make something like that apply to your individual context in your school, um, especially if you are coming up with all of the other materials yourself. It's like, ultimately, a high quality instructional material in, in a high school classroom would free up the teacher to be able to respond more to the local context, to be able to connect more to the local context, because that is so important. I wanted to ask a question. Most of the people on here are on, on social, social studies educators. I know we have some ELA people on here, and we're talking about knowledge in ELA a lot right now. And they're talking about how it connects to reading comprehension in the early grades. And I know there's some great writing and research out there. Could you talk a little bit about the sort of importance of knowledge when you move across and you talk about ELA literacy reading comprehension? Yeah, Elizabeth started and see if I, there's, a, yeah, I'm sure she'll be pretty comprehensive in her answer. <laughs> well, I was actually, I was following this line of thinking, Martin, related to um, George's comment about the local civics oriented current events and what's the barrier to entry if I'm grappling with something I found online, an article, um, you know, a, a political ad or something like that. If I don't have the background knowledge that I need to understand the content of that particular article, if that's if that's making sense, right? So what's the vocabulary? Um, what are the language demands? What are the conceptual understandings I need to have about local civics oriented current events when I'm thinking about, you know, government officials, roles, there are references to things that I don't understand because I don't have that foundation about the, the function and structure of government or um, whatever it is. So when I have a deep knowledge base, I can actually comprehend more complex texts. And without that, they're like, just imagine like a you know, text with redacted information. It's just like uh, sharpied out. Um, there's a limit to how much of that I can grapple with, not because I don't have the cognitive ability to grapple with complex concepts, but I just, I lack the background knowledge. It's like when if someone's talking to me about tax law, I'm not going to understand it in a way that an accountant would um, because I lack the background knowledge. I can read it. I can understand the words individually, but I can't make meaning. I can't really comprehend what it's getting at. Yeah, there's that famous, those famous sort of passages out there about baseball or cricket, right? And like, 
an eight-year-old who really understands cricket is going to be a, be able to read that passage with more understanding than I would be able to as as someone who would consider him, myself a sophisticated reader. Um, yeah. Because I don't it's know not, about that subject. It's, you know, it's interesting to see also in where the emphasis comes in and knowledge and the conversations in ELA and where the emphasis comes in in terms of knowledge in, in the social studies space. It's a little bit of different angles there. I think in, in in ELA, there's a lot of talk about knowledge for better readers and writers and that and that comprehension. And I think some of the newer knowledge-rich curriculum, what they do really well is like really think about the scaffolding of that knowledge. And so they're very intentional about thinking about how does how does doing this get me to there, get to me to here, to really get to that complexity. In social studies, sometimes it can be so hard, honestly, because in, one of the reasons is because so, instructional time for social studies is so short, we're having to like jump in to much deeper conceptual understandings. And a lot of the standards in social studies ask for conceptual understanding. You know, how does conflict arise? Those kinds of things. Rather, like in a good way, it's not just the fact nugget that you're going to forget, it is those conceptual understandings. But having to really think about how do we get to that complexity, and we often find that the text complexity can then can then be a barrier to building that new knowledge, right? And so there's such a catch-22 and really such a marriage that these two things have of using that scaffolding and understanding and now vocabulary building and ability to get to the complex text that then allows us to get to much more deep application of knowledge, conceptual understanding, schema building to new and novel context, all of those things. It's just so interconnected and complex. It's it's hard to tease it all out, honestly. Um, there is just such interweaved and at its best, they really, sh they, they really have, you know, such superpowers together. I want to just uh, read Teresa's comment because I feel like both of you will have a lot to say about it. Um, as an elementary teacher, I'm quite concerned that with the push to shift to the science of reading and the integrated products cropping up all over the place, vague background knowledge will supplant state standards and time for quality inquiry in K-5. Um, and this could see, you know, this is a little bit of a, maybe a divide in the social studies space and the ELA space. Um, but I, I, I want to hear what you would, how you would respond to Teresa's comment. Yeah, it's, it's on, oh, sorry, Elizabeth. I was just going to say like time for social studies is definitely like, we're the, we're definitely the time for social studies crowd. Sorry. I think that I would say it's, it's really, I, I, I don't, I don't know if I'd have a, a clear answer because I think the truth is, is like, knowledge is incredibly important for reading comprehension. And so the shift to understanding that and its importance for reading and not just phonics, but also the importance of knowledge for reading comprehension is incredibly important. And so these curriculum, I actually think are, are important. The science of reading, again, is not just phonics. It is about reading comprehension and needing knowledge for reading comprehension. And so those are good things, these integrated products. On the other hand, they are creating a challenge because they are taking up more and more of the instructional time of the day, and they are not a social studies program. They are also not a science curriculum. They are not getting to the disciplinary skills of that study. They are not getting, they are not often assessing on that knowledge. They are not getting to those larger conceptual understandings that we were talking about. And so that the application of knowledge of you know, time for quality inquiry of like some of those things that we might think about, those are that don't happen in those. And so I, you know, it's it's so challenging. Like in, in education, we swing the pendulum to something and then we kind of forget about something else that's important and we leave something else behind. And I think what Teresa is talking about is, is that challenge. And that is said with full respect to these knowledge-rich curriculum. I, I do really think they're trying to think deeply about what this looks like. I think, unfortunately, there hasn't been, you know, this isn't being done in conjunction with these other content areas. And so it's kind of taking over those days and, and that's a real challenge. I would also say that many times when, when they're integrating social studies, what that means is history. And social studies is more than history. There's so much in our world and our experience to learn from geography and economics and civics and other disciplines in the social studies. So um, I feel like that is, that's a concern that I have. Well, um, we had a question. I'm not sure 
uh, the, the questioner asked, but wondering where the misconception that there's a dichotomy about inquiry and knowledge building comes from. Like, yeah. and I think it may be out, it might be the kind of inquiry that gets talked about. Um, so can we talk a little bit about uh, about that? I think there's truth in what has been said about some of the think memes about inquiry and, and you know, my company's name is Inquired. I like inquiry tattooed. I don't really, but like if you could be basically tattooed here, I'm an inquiry believer. And yet I think that some inquiry is done, done pretty badly. And there's been in this name of kind of students just going and gaining knowledge and, um, you know, they'll go out and do this and we'll, we should really be about what do the students want to do that can lead to some real challenges of how are we thinking about the learning outcomes? How are we thinking about the assessment of knowledge? How are we thinking about the scaffold of learning? All of those things, and it could be a real equity issue. Are we expecting that student, how much knowledge are we expecting that students are coming in with so that they can go do that higher order thinking? And so there, the truth is on both ends of the spectrum, there are reasons why any stereotype often comes. There's something that probably led there and I don't agree with the stereotype or that definition of it, but there's a reason why that is. And I think that that, that dichotomy is based on some things that have not been done well. And I, I do think we need to be incredibly cognizant and willing to say in the social studies community, especially for those of us who are lovers and believers in inquiry is like saying, what is high quality inquiry based instruction mean? It's not yeah. just saying, is it inquiry based learning? What does that mean? It's like, oh, I, I did, you know, ask my students some questions. I sent them off and had them think about what works in their con local context. Like that's not enough. What does high quality inquiry based instruction? I mean? love Joanna just chimed in with active, but aimless. Yeah. That's a great way to describe bad inquiry. Yeah. Like, yes. And Definitely. engagement doesn't always mean it's good instruction, right? Like if they're that that's really great. I we're gonna we're gonna steal that one, Joanna. Active but aimless. Um, yeah. uh we have other other uh things popping up. Are there good ways to integrate trade books into teaching ELA and social studies or social studies? And so that would be a question for maybe you. Uh, Elizabeth, what is that like? I think that is a, a question from how do I how do I pull these things together? Um, and it, would you have a response to that? I think that I I really admire the hard work that teachers do to try and integrate um, two different subject areas in a way that that's coherent. You know, how can I streamline learning for my students and find whether it's a trade book or a primary source, whatever the text is or the, the video or the artifact, what are the ways that something can kind of do double duty? And it can either, it holds information that my students are going to learn. We're going to build new knowledge or they're going to leverage their knowledge. They're going to take what they already know in order to interpret it. And it's, you know, maybe it can be both, but it definitely can be one or the other. And that I'm, you know, I'm building new knowledge by gaining this information from this source, or I'm really applying my disciplinary thinking to interpret this source in ways that are really challenging to me. And it's not easy. We, we, spend all day thinking about this, how the right source, the right text can pair with what students need to learn or how they can deepen that understanding or apply that learning really rigorously and how those are scaffolded and sequenced. So some are helping to build that foundation and they might be a little bit simpler and others are like really complex and challenging and maybe more supported. And I'm really sequencing that and I'm thinking about, all right, what do students already know? What do they need to know in order to grapple with this particular text or this particular content? And how am I filling in those gaps? So I don't know if that's a good answer. Um, I don't have advice for, for trade books versus a, a different type of source, but just thinking about all of the different ways that a source can deliver information or can require students to apply what they know in a, a new way or a challenging way. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull one more question from the chat and then talk a little bit about upcoming webinars. Todd says, 
many teachers are scared to try inquiry because of the freedom to learn it gives students. What do you think is the best way to help with that fear? You know, Todd, I actually think this dichotomy plays into this. That's this idea that they're just going to go through osmosis, kind of get knowledge. Um, and as a teacher, teachers take the responsibility really, you know, deeply. And they do believe that they're often that they are part of their role and responsibility is to ensure the students are walking away with knowledge. And so the I I think that some of those those challenges of what inquiry has brought and not really thinking deeply about that scaffolding and pieces of that actually can help talk to those teachers is like, yes, your students are gaining knowledge. This is where high quality instructional materials again come in is yes, there is deep rigorous knowledge building in this. And it's through that rigorous knowledge building that they are then authentically applying that knowledge. Um, and it's not just kind of, you know, sending your kids off without structure. I, I will often say that a really well done inquiry-based classroom has more structure than any place in the world. There are so many routines and so many things that need to be put in place in order for students to get there. And so to be able to go in and just and get, do those things in application. So I, I think those two I things are- Back to enough. what Bryce asked too. He said, it's hard for teach for students because they come into an inquiry-based class and they've never been in one before. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it is about a highly structured environment um, so that students have the freedom to learn. It seems like a, a contradiction, structure and freedom, but it is very much like uh, the importance of a of structure and inquiry. Is. Yeah. Well, when we're thinking about inquiry again, gathering evidence, drawing conclusions, using evidence to support a claim or an opinion or position, thinking about how does this evidence align with what I thought yesterday? How is my um, understanding evolving over time? There's a lot of metacognition involved in inquiry. And there's also a lot of questioning what I thought I knew. Um, again, students generating their own questions. They Students are naturally curious. They're naturally um, and our and our our kids are brilliant, but that's a different way of learning, and it's a different routine in the classroom that you have to provide and and build up in your students. If what they're used to is being spoon fed information from you that they just have to remember and then um, show you that they remembered it on a test later, and then they can forget about it, yeah, th that's going to be a new way of learning for them. Um, it's it's a lot more rigorous. Um, someone just shared the swimming pool image that we love so much from Trevor McKenzie. Um, yeah. Check that out. I think that was Teresa. Um, I just want to say that we've got a couple um, more webinars coming up, and I just want to share my screen to say um, on the 22nd, we're going to have Daniel Willingham join us. If you don't know um, Daniel Willingham's work, check it out. He is a psychologist and author, professor at the University of Virginia. He is talking about what's happening inside students' brains and how we can um, teach for students' brains and help them learn for themselves. Um, then we are gonna be joined uh, by Mary Burkhauser and Sarah Milo Hoskow. They're gonna be talking more about schema, schemata in the plural, uh, and how those help us apply knowledge to novel scenarios. Then we're gonna be joined by Mary Helen Imordino Yang. She is the director of the USC Center of Effective Neuroscience. And we're gonna talk about how experience, emotion and engagement help in knowledge building. So I just really um, uh, would love to see all of you there uh, at those webinars and please share them out with others. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. And uh, Shanti and Elizabeth, thank you as always. It's great to have you. Thank you, Martin. It was fun. Thanks, Martin. It was a pleasure. Uh, look for the blog post on Monday, and uh, we will uh, have the resources that we talked about and a recording for you as well. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you.